Okay, so it's, uh, it's 5 p.m. and uh, we'd better get going. Before introducing our guest, I want to say a few words about uh, Nätverket för psykedelisk vetenskap, the organizers of this talk. So my name is Philip Bromberg and I am the chairman of Nätverket för psykedelisk vetenskap. Nätverket is a non-profit organization which was founded in 2016 with the purpose of promoting research into psychedelic substances. We have been organizing lectures here at Karolinska for the last few years. We also have a journal club which is for members only. We organized a conference last year, Colloquium on Psychedelic Psychiatry 2018. And we also have a prize for the best thesis, a bachelor's thesis or master's thesis related to uh, psychedelic research. So if you or someone you know is uh, about to write a thesis, um, please consider writing it with and related to psychedelic research and you may be awarded 5,000 Swedish crowns. So this is something that we're doing to, to promote interest in, uh, in psychedelic science among students of Swedish universities. If you would like to become a member, it is 300 crowns per year and 200 crowns if you're a student. And uh, you're very welcome to talk to me or someone else from the organization just outside after the lecture. So, we are honored today to have uh, Dr. Matthew Johnson here today. Uh, Matthew is Associate Professor of Psychiatry at Johns Hopkins University, where he has been doing research with Professor Roland Griffiths on psychedelics since 2004. So it's really one of the most uh, experienced uh, people that we have here from the field today. And I want to share that, uh, that the Johns Hopkins team was awarded $17 million last week to, in order to fund psychedelic research there for the next five years. So it's a huge donation for Johns Hopkins and it's a, it's a big deal for the, for the field in general, um, which makes this talk even more interesting because it's a, a little bit of a, of a glimpse of the future, perhaps, of what might happen in the field during the next few years. So uh, Matthew will be speaking for about an hour and uh, then we will do uh, some question and answer. So if you have any, any questions during the talk, please write them down and we'll have uh, microphones going around afterwards. And we will be done by 6.30 for those of you who are waiting for dinner. So uh, please uh, start with a big round of applause for Dr. Matthew Johnson. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I want to thank the Karolinska Institute, um, thank Philip and the organizers for setting this up, and thank all of you for coming here. Um, it's a real honor to present um, here at this institution. Can I ask, I'm, I'm curious about the audience, so how many of you are, are, are in the Karolinska Institute? So yeah, yeah, about half or a little, I'd say more than half of the audience. And how many people here study a, or treat addiction or study addiction in one form or another? Okay, a smaller minority in the, in the population. Okay, um, so uh, the work that I'm going to show you is focused on a nicotine addiction, but I'll, I'll, I'll briefly tell you about some of our other work with, with psilocybin and other psychedelics at the beginning, but mainly focus on nicotine addiction and also uh, mention uh, some other forms of addiction that we have data um, regarding psychedelics for. But first, I want to thank a, a really great uh, group of individuals I've been fortunate to work with over 15 years, and this group has expanded dramatically from those early days. So 
it's far more people that I, than I can name all individually, but certainly you know, Roland Griffiths, who I started my postdoctoral fellowship with 15 years ago, and we've collaborated ever since on this line of research. Mary Casamano, Al Garcia, Fred Barrett, Al and Fred are both faculty members in the psychiatry department now, along with Roland and I, and just a whole host of, of uh, uh, great individuals on the team over the years. And also funding from, uh, particularly for this smoking cessation, nicotine dependence line of research, funding has largely come from the Hefter Research Institute, the Beckley Foundation, William Harrison, and, and some support has been provided by the National Institute on Drug Abuse in the United States, their intramural research program. And if you want to find out more about our group in general, you can check out our website at hopkinspsychedelic.org. So Philip mentioned this, but within the last week, we had the news we finally solidified some uh, funding that's going to, I, th I hope and expect to be a game changer for us and hopefully for the field over the next five years. So this is thanks to funding from the Stephen and Alexandra Cohen Foundation and the Tim Ferriss Collaborative. And I'll just tell you very briefly some of this list of studies that we're going to get into, these different topics that are going to be new for us. Um, we're going to be looking at opioid addiction, psilocybin, and the treatment of opioid addiction. I'll be the principal investigator on that as well as um, being the principal investigator for research looking at psilocybin in the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, there's also going to be uh, studies using psilocybin in treatment of anorexia. Fred Barrett's going to lead a study using fMRI to study the treatment uh, using psilocybin, and this was all psilocybin, by the way, psilocybin in the treatment of alcoholism with comorbid depression. So this is finally looking at, at comorbidity. Usually these psychiatric disorders don't come in isolation. And he's going to be looking at perhaps some common mechanisms using fMRI, common mechanisms between uh, depression and alcoholism that may be in common in terms of the way psilocybin is helping. Um, accidentally was listed anorexia twice. Uh, but Alzheimer's disease, hopefully the results are twice as good as we're expecting. <laughs> Um, but specifically the mood issues, depression within Alzheimer's disease. And um, depressed mood symptoms in this uh, condition that's come to be known as post-treatment Lyme disease, what has been called in the United States chronic Lyme disease, a rather mysterious syndrome. And then we're in, in healthy normals, Roland is going to be the principal investigator on, uh, in some individuals who don't need help for a disorder, but just in the spirit of understanding um, effects and healthy normals and optimizing functioning, we're going to be looking at psilocybin microdosing as well as the effects of high doses of psilocybin on creativity. And finally, Fred Barrett is going to run a, a, a biomarkers core. We're going to be collecting genetics and other biomarkers in all of these studies and hoping to address some predictors overall in terms of um, both uh, predictors of treatment response and uh, markers of change for these various disorders. So most of our work has focused on the psychedelic compound psilocybin. It's the active agent in over a hundred species of mushrooms. It's considered a classic psychedelic, which is really, it's more particular than just the general term psychedelic. Sometimes psychedelic can refer to other compounds such as NMDA antagonists like ketamine or PCP, or it can refer to anticholinergic agents. But classic psychedelic refers to serotonin 2A um, acting compounds. So in this family is not just uh, psilocybin, but also LSD, mescaline, which is in peyote and other cacti, and dimethyltryptamine, which is in the south. American shamanistic preparation ayahuasca. Classic psychedelics are a difficult drug class to define, but I believe the best definition I have come across comes from Lester Grinspoon. He defined it as this, a drug which without causing physical addiction, craving, major physiological disturbances, delirium, 
disorientation or amnesia more or less reliably produces thought, mood, and perceptual changes, otherwise rarely experienced in dreams, contemplative and religious exaltation, flashes of vivid involuntary memory, and acute psychosis. We do know that the serotonin 2A receptor is the, the primary um, mediating activity at the receptor level. It's sort of the, at least the first domino in the chain of biological events that cause these psychedelic effects. And we know this from good work uh, using the drug discrimination model where you can essentially train a, a rat or a mouse to um, signal to the researcher whether or not they have received a similar drug or not. So you train them to identify uh, whether they've received saline or an active compound like LSD, and then you can test other compounds, and you can use antagonists to block that receptor to test um, what is mediating those effects. And we do know that antagonists at the serotonin 2A receptors will block the effects both in these animal models and the subjective effects in humans. Um, for example, the work that's been done by Franz Bollenweider in Switzerland. We also know that serotonin 2A affinity is well correlated with human potency. Richard Glennon um, sh provided a powerful demonstration of this. You can see on the x-axis the human hallucinogenic dose and on the y-axis um, the, the 2A receptor affinity and just a, you know, a remarkably strong roughly linear correlation between the two. Classic psychedelics including psilocybin appear to have not just a historic but absolutely prehistoric um, uh, lineage. Here in the, on the left as well as in the middle you see examples from both Mesoamerica and South America suggesting the ritualistic use of psilocybin mushrooms and some other compounds like morning glory seeds which contain a relative of LSD. But those date back from roughly 500 years to a couple of thousand years ago. But then on the right, there's a, um, I'm showing a cave painting from northern Africa, which was, has been dated back to around 10,000 years ago, which is, and in, in what's likely depicted there are sort of these, these, um, these individuals undergoing an apparent ecstatic dance and they, their heads have turned into mushrooms and so arguably, these are individuals experiencing psilocybin mushroom intoxication. And so that's just remarkable. I mean, we're talking about about you know, four to 5,000 years before the earliest known human civilizations in Mesopotamia, so an absolutely ancient history. So fast forwarding quite a, a length of time, from the 1940s to the 1970s, psychedelics were intensely investigated as research tools and therapeutics, and the discovery of LSD um, occurred around the same, same time as this emerging understanding of uh, neurotransmission in the brain, and it was discovered that LSD was very similar to this compound that was first found in the gut, serotonin, and so the remarkable potency, the idea that you could have a compound that had such powerful psychological effects at only you know, something as, in as little as 100 micrograms that was a strong clue uh, to the I idea that um, uh, chemicals that affect uh, neurotransmission um, had a large role in, in what you would call the mind. And then aside, as, aside from research tools, there were promising findings for using psychedelics, particularly LSD, in the treatment of cancer-related distress. These were terminally ill patients who were suffering because of their illness, and also LSD in the treatment of alcoholism. And then there were the dark ages. So, you know, despite some initial promising findings, there were several decades where there was essentially no human research. And I argue it's not because research in humans could not be done safely, it could be, and there were some reckless researchers and they became well known, but in fact there were many more responsible researchers that were um, 
very careful in articulating that there were risks and that you had to address those risks uh, when conducting research and when using these compounds therapeutically. And so the reaction, the dormancy, um, the cessation of research, research was really a result of the association between LSD and the 1960s counterculture. And to, to be clear, there were casualties of just the, you know, the, the use of LSD by the public. Many people used and did not have problems. In fact, many of those people claimed that it profoundly benefited their lives, but others were clearly harmed. Um, and it's also important to know that back in those days, the average dose of LSD used by the public was around 300 micrograms. And at least in the US, an average dose these days is around 50 micrograms. So peop, you know, there were some heavy doses going around. So people would come to the emergency departments and having some real psychiatric distress. And we do know, I'll, I'll mention this later, that people with the vulnerability to schizophrenia or psychotic disorders, that they can particularly be harmed. And it was probably a good subset of those people that had the, the most damage done by exposure to LSD. So I, I'll, that's sort of the history part of my, my talk. I'll describe, um, I'll focus, as I said, on nicotine uh, addiction treatment, but I'll just very quickly go through a list of some of the highlights of what we've done in our research program uh, over 15 years, a little longer than that, actually. So we were the first research site uh, since the 1970s to administer a classic psychedelic to drug-naive participants, and that was published in um, the year 2000, Roland's first study with psilocybin. Uh, one of my first efforts was to uh, lead the, the drafting of what we see as guidelines for human psychedelic research, um, published in 2008, reviewing the risks and providing recommendations, drawing from the lessons of the past, like how you conduct this research safely and I've been told by um, colleagues at the US FDA that they, in fact, are using these guidelines to evaluate um, new research protocols submitted to them. So that's exactly the type of thing we were hoping for to help um, safely guide this research forward. Uh, we conducted the first research showing that a psychedelic changes a personality dimension. Um, we found an increased uh, an increase in the personality dimension of openness, with, which refers to a broad tolerance to other, other perspectives, um, the ability to hold different perspectives that seem to compete with each other but take more of an orientation that they might mo both be true, and also having an appreciation for aesthetics. This is what sort of defines the personality dimension of openness. And we found across combining the data across our first two studies that there was a significant increase in that dimension. We published the first research showing psilocybin to acutely increase headache um, uh, based on our second study, our dose effects with psilocybin. We published the first blinded research showing the psychedelic effects of another interesting compound, salvinorin A, which is a kappa opioid agonist that has powerful intense, intense uh, psychoactive effects. We developed the first mystical experience scale validated for the assessment of acute um, experiences, so from drugs or other experiences. I'll tell you a little bit later what I mean by mystical experience. And we published the first research on psychedelic therapy for tobacco or nicotine addiction. I'll show you a lot more about that. And we published the first scale for measuring the so-called bad trip, um, the panic reactions, the anxiety that can happen, particularly at a high dose. And therapeutically, we encourage, in a safer setting in the lab, we, refer, we encourage our participants to think of these as challenging experiences because where the real harm happens is when these reactions happen in a dangerous environment, when, when someone could potentially hurt themselves or someone else by accident. And we conducted the largest study of psilocybin in treating cancer-related distress, and those were dramatic and immediate reductions in depression and anxiety that we found lasted from a single high dose lasted for at least six months. Um, really astonishing effects. And the group at New York University found virtually identical results we published around the same time. And we published the first study showing that MDMA pill testing 
reduces um, uh, intention to consume unknown or unintended drugs, um, sort of in support of uh, uh, the idea that there may be some validity to the idea of harm reduction when people are using some of these drugs in the public. And uh, we've conducted research recently on psilocybin in people beginning a meditation program and in long-term meditators. So we've already published the work in novice or beginning meditators. I won't have time to uh, go into further detail, but there were some interesting interactions. And finally, I, 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 uh, I and my colleagues published a review paper that uh, reviewed the risks and recommended um, how psilocybin should be rescheduled if it, is, it passes phase three studies and is approved as a medicine. And so that study is right here. We ultimately concluded if it is approved as a medicine, it should probably belong in Schedule 4, um, based on the, which is in the U.S. scheduling system. There are analogs um, in different nations. But it's, it's a few steps away from the most restricted category of Schedule 1. But briefly summarizing the harms, uh, we do know that, it can, that psilocybin and other classic psychedelics can cause lasting harm uh, in people with psychosis, such as schizophrenia, or predisposition for those disorders. So if there's a good signal that they might you know, be destined or have a good likelihood of developing one of those disorders. For anyone, they can cause fear, panic, confusion, the so-called bad trip, which again, in an in a uncontrolled circumstance, could potentially lead to harmful behavior. Psilocybin in particular causes modest elevations in pulse and blood pressure. Nothing severe, but it's a, it is of concern for people of, of, of severe um, cardiovascular vulnerability. As I mentioned, we've shown that they cause headache in the day following use. Um, it's not of a severity that would suggest that would prevent its medical use, but nonetheless, it's a risk to be aware of. Um, there is this interesting phenomenon of persisting perceptual changes. It, it's a rare psychiatric disorder called hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder. Interestingly, it appears to exclusively um, happen in recreational settings and has never been documented in either the earlier era or the current era of laboratory psilocybin or other psychedelic research. So it may be a product of a very particular vulnerability of impure drugs, unknown dosage, and interactions with other drugs, including alcohol. So there's a, but nonetheless, something to probe for in research. Um, importantly, we know that despite having these potential harms, one harm that isn't present for psilocybin and other classic psychedelics like LSD, it's not a drug of addiction. So it can be, it can be abused, meaning it can be used in a dangerous way an obvious example is if you drive after taking it or you use in a way that interferes with school or family life, with one's job, but no one is really engaging in compulsive drug seeking, using on a daily basis and having self-control problems where they want to stop but they can't control themselves to stop. That just, that does not appear to happen with psilocybin. Fortunately, all of the known risks that I listed above can be squarely addressed in clinical research, and they, it, these can all be squarely addressed in potential medical use if it's ever approved based on the data. And that's through screening people out who are vulnerable, um, for example, at severe cardiovascular um, risk or predisposition to schizophrenia, by monitoring people it's not recommended that this would ever be sent home with people to use, um, at least at these high doses that we've been exploring, but only used um, in this uh, setting where the person is constantly monitored, monitored and then having follow-up care um, where you can uh, cast a wide net and make sure you're assessing for any um, lasting harms that may come about. And I mentioned the, these guidelines for safe research. Um, thankfully, they've helped a growing number of, of institutions and organizations start research with psilocybin. Um, hopefully, that will happen someday in Sweden. But I've mentioned the challenging experience. I, I, I'm just mentioning here that we have developed this scale to assess it. So I think important in this research is to 
study the good, the bad, and the ugly. We, you know, we want to acknowledge the risks and carefully document and record um, the good and the bad. Part of the safety factors is to be in a safe and comforting personal and physical environment and personal environment. So to have a, a comfortable you know, room, a nice looking room that it's conducted in, and to have individuals that the patient or the participant has gotten to know. So there's a therapeutic relationship that's been developed. It, one can easily suffer from paranoia if they're at a high dose, if they're interacting with people that they don't know well. Um, so it's, it's important to have this. And sometimes holding someone's hand can be one of the most powerful ways um, of reassuring them that they're not being left alone, they're being taken care of. So now I'll move into the treatment of addiction. So I've explained to you why you know, um, that, that, that psilocybin doesn't lead to addiction, but why in the world would we think that it can treat addiction? Well, one line of evidence comes from this older era using LSD to treat alcoholism. There were a lot of studies, but only six of them used, uh, used LSD um, in comparison, in randomized studies comparing LSD to some other control condition. And recent, uh, several years ago, some Norwegian colleagues conducted a meta-analysis meta on these data. It's a way to kind of to get different studies to speak the same statistical language um, to look at the results. And each one of these dots, these six dots, um, are the individual studies, anything to the right of this horizontal line indicates LSD, people were better with LSD. Anything to the left means people were, um, that the control condition was better. And what's being shown is the, um, the odds that the individual would be improved at the first follow-up session and that the timing of that varied across the various studies. And then this big dot kind of represents the studies in aggregate. And essentially what it found was that near, LSD nearly doubled the odds that an alcoholic patient would be improved at that first follow-up point. So it's an odds ratio of about two. That's what that means. And that, that's a large effect. I mean, that rivals anything that we have today. So in addition to that older laboratory research, there's also this interesting anthropological evidence looking at the ceremonial use of various classic psychedelics and its association with addiction recovery. So there are examples of peyote use, which contains mescaline in the Native American church in the United States, and also um, anthropological reports based on ayahuasca ceremonies. This contains dimethyltryptamine, or DMT, in South America and in um, some South American-based religions. So, I don't know if that's me, but several of these, you know, these reports, you know, they report this finding that individuals engaging in these ceremonies are likely to recover from alcoholism or other forms of addiction. It's important to be skeptical and keep in mind that religious involvement is generally associated with addiction recovery. So this by itself doesn't prove anything, but it's suggestive. There was one older study also, just one study, but using LSD to treat heroin addiction in the United States, and so that looked promising as well. And so that led to this idea that there might, might be a anti-addiction efficacy at play across different drugs. So we thought if it works for different forms of addiction, let's try cigarette smoking. So we looked at this for a number of reasons. One, we wanted to test the boundaries. It's also something that I had had previous research experience with going back to graduate school. Um, and it's also easily quantifiable. You can get someone to urine, uh, collect a urine sample and to also collect a breath sample blowing into a machine where you can measure cotinine, a nicotine metabolite in the urine, and also measure carbon monoxide, um, a biomarker of smoking, in the breath. So you have different ways to biologically confirm if they have been smoking recently or not. And so the initial study was in 15 people. We didn't have much money to support it. so. And we weren't even sure whether it would be promising enough to follow up on. So we did a, the small study 
looking at the safety and just the potential efficacy to see if it was even worthy of that follow-up. It got a lot of press. Um, it's always nice when the press, you know, reports on science. Now, to be clear, we always say our research should not encourage any use, you know, on your own. But I want to be especially clear, that's a lot of mushrooms. Definitely don't do that. That's a big plate of mushrooms. <laughs> so we don't have control over exactly what's shown by Newsweek. These are the demographics of those 15 people. The, the important thing to note here is that they, they had been smoking an average of over 30 years, and they smoked nearly a pack a day on average. So these were not lightweights. These were real smokers. They, were, they all tried to quit before. Um, yeah. They were hardcore smokers and really wanted to quit. The study timeline is that there was a 15-week protocol with weekly meetings. We had a cognitive behavioral therapy backdrop. And so these were sort of standard cognitive behavioral therapies for helping quit smoking, such as assigning a target quit date ahead of time instead of just deciding to quit spontaneously. You say, OK, I'm going to quit three weeks from now, and I'm going to work towards that. Uh, keeping a smoking diary during that time to kind of uh, reflect on your thoughts and circumstances when you do smoke, what's happening, what's prompting you to smoke. Preparing them for after they quit, like what happens if you do slip and have a cigarette, how to best respond to that, things like this. And we had three psilocybin sessions over eight weeks, so we started at a moderate dose in the first session, and then we moved up to um, our highest dose, 30 milligrams body weight adjusted on the second and the third session. And the first psilocybin session was on their target quit date that they assigned several weeks ahead of time. So on one day, you know, they were going to both have this big psilocybin session and quit smoking. So it was a big day for people. There, was no seri there were no serious adverse events due to psilocybin. And that's been the case for all of the modern era of psilocybin studies. So thankfully, um, things are looking safe when conducted with the safeguards we have in place. Here is one of the biological markers of recent smoking, carbon monoxide. So we have the, the, the study visits, the various study visits on the x-axis. We have the carbon monoxide level on the y-axis. This is the, the typical cutoff going across of marking you know, evidence of recent smoking. Um, yes or no. And then this vertical line is when they have their first psilocybin session. That's the target quit date. This is before psilocybin and this is after. So clearly you, you don't need you know, fancy statistics to suggest there's a pre-post difference going on here. So we are excited to see that. In terms of um, the percentage of people who were abstinent, there were 80% of people who were abstinent Six months after, um, yeah, six months after treatment, and there were, I think, okay, yeah, I'm having an optical illusion because it looks like my numbers aren't lining up from here. It's because I'm looking at it from an angle. But 80%, hopefully that's clear to you, 80% of people were abstinent at six months. And that number held up to, 60% of individual being abstinent at an average of two and a half years. So those are very encouraging results compared to other interventions. I do want you to take this with a grain of salt. I mean, this is just preliminary. And th these are comparing results across studies, so it's really not fair. But I just wanted to give you some sense of the ballpark that we're in, like why we were encouraged that this was worthy of a follow-up. Here I'm showing you our results on the right at six months, 80%, compared to um, the best treatments out there, including the best medication, varenicline. Similar to other research we've conducted with cancer patients and our results in healthy normals, we, we found that long-term benefit was related to not just getting psilocybin, but to the nature of the psychological experience that unfolded during their session. So this, this uh, maybe I'll jump to it now. The mystical experience 
it sounds a little woo-woo. It sounds like, uh, you know, maybe not so serious, but it actually is referring to a well-defined psychological construct. And it was first uh, discussed by the founder of American psychology over 100 years ago, William James. And aside from psychedelics, this refers to extraordinary experiences that humans have reported apparently throughout time. You can find reports across different cultures, across the centuries, from different languages, um, uh, different parts of the world. M a lot of times from a religious perspective, but sometimes outside of religion. But people having these experiences where they report an overwhelming sense of uni unity, in other words, feeling at one with the universe, um, feeling one with, with humankind, having a, a positive, overwhelming positive mood, feeling a transcendence of time and space, sort of like stepping beyond the bounds of time and space, and having a sense of ineffability, like no matter how hard you try, you will never be able to fully describe this in words. And so these experiences, it, the idea is that this might be a core human construct, despite the cultural variations that might shape the surface level content. It may be that this is a certain type of experience that human beings have. And we've developed an instrument I'm showing here, the MEQ-30, specifically designed to, to study this in the context of an acute manipulation like a drug effect. But back to our um, smoking results, we found greater, su greater success in people who had that type of experience long term. And we found that the, the level of mystical experience was associated with how much they reduced craving for smoking. And so that's like people in our, our cancer study who had a stronger mystical experience were less depressed and less anxious. We found significant correlations there um, six months later. And we found similar claims of benefit in healthy normals, people who had stronger mystical experiences. And so, Importantly, all of that is after controlling for just people's ratings of how strong the drug is. So it's not just having this intense drug experience. It's having a certain nature of psychological experience that seems to play a role in long-term benefit. Okay, we conducted a qualitative analysis. I'm mainly a, a, I'm a quantitative researcher, but I worked with colleagues with special, uh, specialization in this to really conduct semi-structured interviews. It, you know, what was going on here? Maybe there's something we're not assessing in our various scales that we should have asked about. So this is, for, for people who said that the psilocybin helped them quit smoking, we asked, well, why, how? Why, how do you think it helped you? Um, why? People, multiple people said, that the psilocybin experience provided a persisting sense of interconnectedness, awe, and curiosity that helped them to move past the difficulties quitting smoking. They reported reduced smoking withdrawal symptoms compared to the previous times when they had quit smoking. They reported a host of other positive changes, such as increased altruism, and appreciation of aesthetics. This is sort of like the increase in the personality dimension of openness I mentioned earlier. And they claim that these benefits went along with and helped them overcome the urge to smoke. And they claimed um, insights into their own self-identity and the particular reasons for them why they smoked. And this differed across the person, but it seems like their personal narrative, you know, why that person, you know, what has gone on in their history of smoking, you know, the role that it's played in their unique life. They really had some profound insights into that story. We heard so many um, reports, especially early on when I was presenting these data, sometimes at standard scientific meetings, and people would sometimes come up to me afterwards and say, oh, I quit like this, and you know, they said they were just taking a psychedelic for fun maybe years and years ago, and they, they would say, I just quit smoking. I thought, what am I doing? And they quit smoking. And so I also looked online and found some trip reports with the same type of story on sites like Arrowhead or Blue Light. So I put together a survey, and we found over 1,100 people 
that said, oh yes, I took a psychedelic and I just, I quit or I strongly reduced the amount that I smoked. And so we wanted to learn, we can't prove any causation here, but here we just wanted to learn from this larger sample, you know, just sort of more about the landscape. And one of the big pop out effects for me was when we asked people, okay, compared, we gave them a laundry list, a long list of withdrawal symptoms. And we said, if you have quit before, and most people had tried to quit smoking before, compare the withdrawal symptom, this, each withdrawal symptom, in relationship to other times when you've quit smoking. So was it the same? Was it, um, let's see, was it the same? Was it more severe, much more severe, or was it less severe or much less severe? And the interesting thing is that for most of the bodily symptoms, of withdrawal, such as fatigue, headaches. People said, yeah, the, the modal response was, it was about the same. But then when we got to the affective symptoms, such as depression, irritability, craving, people said the modal response was not just less severe, but much less severe. So this is interesting in relationship to our work with depression and anxiety in cancer patients. And some other work that's been published in depression um, at Imperial College London, and we've, we haven't published yet, but we've done some pilot study in depression, and we're seeing outside of cancer, and we're seeing some positive results. So this is kind of a clue into linking up this anti-addiction work with the affective work, with the treatment of depression. So perhaps there's a commonality across these different disorders. I think I was supposed to show that slide first, but I've told you all of that. And so now we'll move into the current randomized comparative efficacy trial. So based on those promising results, um, we fortunately received funding from the Hefter Research Inst Institute to conduct a study with 80 treatment-resistant smokers. We randomized them to either psilocybin or nicotine patch. So this was open label. There's, there's not blinding here. We thought this was the next important step. There's randomization to either the nicotine, uh, I'm sorry, the, the psilocybin treatment, or something that we know works, um, a standard that, that's used out there. There's plenty of room for improvement, but nicotine patch works significantly better than a placebo patch, for example, and it's approved for treatment in many places, including the US. And we provide the same cognitive behavioral therapy, similar to what I told you about before. We scaled back from three psilocybin sessions to one psilocybin, not because we don't think more sessions are better, mainly for experimental reasons. We, we're doing fMRI brain imaging, and so we're doing some pre and post imaging, and it complicates things if you have multiple psilocybin sessions. So here are our current results. Um, so different people have gotten to different um, uh, time lengths since their target quit date, so three months, six months. Um, here's 12 months. 25 people have gotten to that point so far. And the current success rates are that we have 47% of people are biologically confirmed as abstinent at 12 months for the psilocybin group, and 20% of people are biologically confirmed as abstinent in the nicotine patch group or nicotine replacement therapy. So that could change. The study is still in process. Um, uh, we see similar results for the larger number of people who have gotten to, um, to six months. So it can change, but so far we're extremely encouraged. If these uh, trends hold up, um, I think we'll be very excited that, that the data is still telling us this is very promising. I'll tell you just a little bit about our fMRI results that I mentioned. This is in... Um, collaboration with some colleagues at the National Institute for Drug Abuse Intramural Research um, Program, Elliot Stein and John Fedota. And I'm going to be showing you, uh, we're still processing these data, um, but these are the first uh, 27 participants. So this is based on 17 psilocybin participants and 10 of the nicotine patch participants. Uh, I'm showing you data on the multi-source interference task and this is a task of cognitive interference. So the way it works is this. Sometimes it's called the oddball task. 
And it's, it's similar to the Stroop task, if you're familiar with that. But your job is to identify in each of these circumstances, let's say on the, on the left here, which is the oddball or the different digit. So you have a single one and two zeros. So the oddball is the one. And on the right, you have you know, two twos and one one. So the oddball is also the one. But your task is to identify the oddball by using the finger number, you know, one, two, three, the finger number that corresponds to that oddball number. So if it's the number one, then you use your first finger. And we all have a tendency, when we're given this task, to use the finger that's in the same spatial location. Um, so the first thing, using the first finger, if that's the one we're identifying. So it kind of it, it kind of trips you up, you know, so to speak. No pun intended. Uh, so uh, maybe it was a little intended, but but on some trials there's no inconsistency. So the spatial uh, uh, the spatially consistent number is the same as the finger number. So that's depicted on the left in the congruent trials. And on the right, you have an example of an incongruent trial. And people have to resist the urge to, uh, they, they want to use this finger, but they got to use this finger. And so the reaction time is slower on those incongruent trials. So you get this congruency effect by subtracting the, the incongruent from the congruent trial time. Whoops. OK, so here are the results. It's kind of a, a difficult task to describe, but hopefully it was clear enough. The psilocybin uh, group shows less cognitive interference the day after quitting. So this is that difference in reaction times. So you see only this, this marginal decrease in the, the nicotine replacement group, non-significant reduction, but a, a large and significant um, reduction for psilocybin, and that's significantly different between the groups. So somehow it seems that the psilocybin participants, the day after, and this is the day after they've gotten psilocybin, compared to a scan that they had some time before the psilocybin session. So it, it appears that after psilocybin, people are somehow have a greater ability to deal with this conflicting information. And so far, I'm kind of thinking of it like this. This might be a, a measure of, of something that people sometimes report that they feel more mindful after, after these sessions. One participant explained it this way, and this participant was a pediatric surgeon. So he's obviously a very... Um, articulate and, and, and smart individual, and he, but like so many smokers, he had been smoking since he was a teenager and had found it very difficult to quit. He said, before when I tried to quit smoking, it's like I would just have the cigarette automatically. So if the pack was in my pocket, I would just go for it and it would just end up in my hand and I'd smoke it without thinking. And if I didn't have cigarettes, I would just sort of automatically drive into the, the store that sold the cigarettes, really just automatically. And it's interesting, in the smoking cessation area, we have a term for this, uh, and it's elsewhere in addiction, called automaticity, sort of like that, that range of a behavior that seems to be in your voluntary control versus involuntary control shifts. So it becomes more automatic. So he said yeah, it was automatic before, but now he, he said it, it's like I was Neo in the movie The Matrix. So you know The Matrix? He says, it's like where the bullets were coming and they'd be like slow motion. You know, like they're coming very, very slow and you'd see it and Neo could just kind of step out of the way. So it's like here goes this, this, this craving for a cigarette and he says, oh, I'm having a craving, but I've quit smoking. That's okay. It'll pass in a minute or two and I'll just step out of the way and the craving just goes by. So maybe it's a, a premature story. We'll see if this holds up. But I, this might be giving us a cognitive signal of that type of story. People are, are more readily capable of dealing with conflicting information. And in terms of the fMRI component, so they're imaged during that task. And so we see a normalization of, the, uh, of task-associated fMRI response in the right lingual gyrus the day after quitting 
for the psilocybin group. So um, there's not this, uh, this changed response in this area associated with task performance that you would normally see. This is just a piece of artwork uh, given to us by one of the uh, smoking cessation volunteers, an old pack of cigarettes encased in acrylic. So there continues to be some signal of cross-drug addiction efficacy. Uh, here I'm showing you data from my colleague Michael Bogenschutz at New York University. Very similar to our pilot smoking cessation trial, he revisited the use of um, psychedelics to treat uh, alcohol use disorders or alcoholism, uh, looking at 10 alcohol dependent patients, combined it with motivational enhancement therapy, um, had a moderate to high dose sessions, two sessions, and essentially found a reduction in both drinking days and heavy drinking days after the psilocybin session. So those are two standard outcomes used in alcohol treatment research. We've recently conducted a similar um, survey study like the nicotine, the smoking one that we've, I told you about earlier. So we recently published one based on people who reported the story that they quit drinking after a psychedelic session with either typically mushrooms or LSD. But we found here this analysis was based on 343 people who uh, claimed to have quit or reduced um, um, that should actually read alcohol, uh, drinking, not smoking, as a result of a psychedelic experience. And after, after it, 83% uh, no longer qualified having any alcohol use disorder, even a mild alcohol use disorder. So one of the interesting things that shook out from that study is we conducted a, a structural equation model of the various responses about these people's story. It's way more complex than I could fully describe, but I just want to jump to the point that the model suggested that there may be a likely um, mediation relationship of both mystical experience and personal insight that they got from the session. In other words, people that claimed a stronger endorsement of those mystical experience criteria and people who claimed uh, uh, greater insights from the session based on another instrument, those people tended to have more personally meaningful sessions and that personal meaning uh, tended to result in stronger improvements or a greater reduction in harmful alcohol use. Okay, so wrapping up, one of the real mysteries is why in the world psychedelics might be successful in treating these different disorders. So not just not just both mood disorders like depression inside and outside of cancer but, and addictions, but then different types of addictions, you know, alcoholism, smoking cessation, based on one older study perhaps, opioid, uh, opioid addiction. Well, it's early, but I would suggest that what might be at play are common mechanisms. You can think of all of these, this, disorders as essentially involving a narrowed behavioral and mental repertoire. So I kind of think of these things as, as addiction broadly defined. That's getting worse. How to? It's your beard. Is it my beard? Ah, oh, OK, thank you. I'm glad I, it's growing out of control. I can't do anything about it. Like, it's taken over. OK, thank you. I'm glad I addressed that. So I think of these as, as all addiction broadly defined, okay? So whether it's like our traditional conception of addiction to a substance, you know, the, the, the narrowing of the behavioral and mental repertoire focused on using a certain substance, or a way of thinking about yourself, stuck in this very ingrained rut of thinking about yourself in a certain way, the self-defeating thoughts that are one of the core features of depression or the, you know, similar thought that can occur in, in the face of a terminal disease, like I'm being punished, life is meaningless, this type of thing. So this might be supported by overly bridged brain networks, and there's some interesting uh, acute results that have emerged from Imperial College London suggesting psychedelics acutely have a powerful effect in changing brain network dy dynamics or uh, changing the way different areas of the brain synchronize with each other. 
So it could be that psychedelics are a powerful way of kind of shaking things up and changing, getting people out of very fixed patterns of network activity in the brain that are aligned with these narrowed repertoires. And it could be that all of this work could be pointing us towards a more endogenous role for what serotonin 2A is really doing. There's still a rather large mystery about what endogenous role these, these receptors are, are playing. It could be, be that they have a role in, um, we, there is some evidence that they have a role in, in learning, and it could be that they essentially help to moderate mental or behavioral plasticity or flexibility. And it doesn't sound very scientific, but one way I, I talked to Michael Pollan for his book, How to Change Your Mind, and he credited me with the very non-scientific uh, term, the dope slap effect. So he says, Johnson believes that psychedelics can be used to change all sorts of behaviors, not just addiction. The key in his view is their power to occasion a sufficiently dramatic experience to dope slap people out of their story, which is essentially what I just told you. Psychedelics can open a window of mental flexibility in which people can let go of their mental, the mental models we use to organize reality. That's really it. We're yeah, about, about 50 minutes, so I didn't take the whole hour, but I just want to end on this slide again, thanking a, a, a long list of wonderful colleagues, and I thank you for your attention. Yeah. Um, so you've hinted at, at common mechanisms uh, a few times during the during the presentation between different disorders and also well between different addictive disorders and also different mental disorders. Do you think that we're that we're getting closer to this to this common mechanism? And what is it? Because we have I like think, yeah. one intervention. You know, it's the same intervention. Right. And it's working for so many different things. Right. I mean, I think we are in our infancy in following that story. So um, I think it's going to take a lot. I mean, one, behaviorally, I think we need to test the boundaries of all of it. I mean, we'll see whether our current smoking cessation trial, like, results hold up. It could be that, you know, we're early in the trial. I mean, we're a good way through, but it could be that things change. So I don't want, yeah. you know, and it could be, there's some, I didn't mention, there's some promising early work by our colleague Peter Hendricks at the University of Alabama, Birmingham with cocaine addiction, you know, that may turn out not to hold up by the time he finishes his trial. Michael Bogenschutz is in the middle of the alcohol um, use disorder trial, a follow-up to that, and I think 100 people. So we'll have to see if it holds up, but um, I think it's going to be really important to you know, look at this broad um, collection of disorders, and there's going to be more. We're going to be part of this USONA trial at multiple sites, looking at the treatment of depression. So hopefully that will validate the results that we we've seen in cancer patients, and, and the results that Rob and Carhart Harris showed in a, a small number of subject and open label pilot studies. So we have to confirm all of this behaviorally, and then I think what we re you know we really need to confirm uh, a. a biological mechanism. So one of the things that we and I know others are looking at are long-term effects on, on a number of brain states including brain network dynamics. So I showed you the results comparing before and the day after but we're also looking at results several months later. So hopefully if we see a lasting signature of you know perhaps uh, change synchronization, increased flexibility, uh, something that is consistent or even opposite in direction of the acute effects, if, if that is a dimension that's being affected long term, that would represent a potential to, if we see a similar biological signature at that, at that network level for both you know, addiction of different forms and in, in depression. But one, one general point along that theme to, to bring up is that and someone asked this at the, the meeting recently in, in Berlin about 
uh, what ability to the, do these compounds maybe to have to teach us about the nature of disorders themselves? And I think that's really one of the most exciting things. They, um, if we if we confirm this kind of story that these are all forms of a narrowed repertoire, you know, it, I mean that really starts to change our very conceptualization of these disorders. We can start focusing more on their underlying commonalities. And that's not so crazy because there's been a movement towards this in psychiatry. One example of this is in the United States, the, the, the National Institute on Mental Health. Several years ago, they decided that people applying for grants for them were no longer requ were require, required to refer to the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for Mental Disorders, which is the psychiatric Bible that defines all of these categories, depression, bipolar, addiction, you know, or substance use disorders in its framework, because their statement was compared to the rest of medicine, psychiatry is, is very different in lacking a mechanistic framework that guides the classifications. In all other areas of medicine, it's a, a truly me mechanistic understanding that helps to classify different illnesses, different disorders, in different categories. But in psychiatry, it's all descriptive. It's at the surface level. So psychedelics might be one tool. So this is a mainstream movement across uh, psychiatry. And um, you might have heard the RDOC um, uh, yeah, movement. So th th this similar idea of what are the basic mechanisms basic cognitive and behavioral mechanisms that underlie different problems. And so psychedelic can be a powerful tool, I think, from that RDOC perspective, in terms of kind of going underneath the hood. It's a long answer, but hopefully. So you mentioned uh, cognitive and, and behavioral elements to, to disorders. Um, I know that you're trained in, in CBT. Um, and in, in psychedelic science, or at least historically, there's been a strong strong influence from psychodynamic and psychoanalytical mm -hmm. perspectives. So what do you think is the role of, of CBT in, in psychedelic research and, and psychedelic therapy today? My general thought is that we can really bring all of these models to bear. I think there's, a, there, there's, there's value in starting with empirically validated methods that we know can work when they're applied. Um, so something like TB, CBT in different areas has some good empirical support. So that's one of the reasons why we went with that. Um, I think there's room for any number of models, in, including potentially psychoanalytic models. Um, it's, I, I think it's just important to be aware of what model one is working with and the strengths and limitations of those models. But I, I think generally psychedelics, we should be creative. We shouldn't necessarily stick to the same treatments that the folks were using in the 1950s. I mean, psychoanalysis, psychodynamic thought were the, were the leading you know, modalities. So now we have a much wider variety of models to work from. And they're not always mutually exclusive from each other. It's not like one is right and one is wrong. Each may speak, speak to a particular uh, level of analysis that might be optimal to work with in one situation or another. All right, thank you. So turning to the audience, um, do you guys have any questions? I think I saw one just here. Would you like to? I was just enjoying your discussion. Hang on. I can just ask you a really quick one. Let me give you the microphone. Very practical question. So in some, oh, okay. uh, somewhere in the beginning of your lecture, you referred to uh, a particularly vulnerable population of subjects, those with a predisposition to schizophrenia. And I know that these sorts of subjects, including those having I mean, a history of, of psychosis spectrum disorders or relatives with uh, schizophrenia spectrum disorders, they are excluded from the study. So I was wondering, maybe it's already in the, uh, in the manuscript, in the paper that you were referring to, do we actually have empirical data to support uh, the fact that this population is vulnerable? Because I know that they're excluded, but I don't know any Right. Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and, and the answer is no, there's not strong empirical work. So and it, it's one of those areas that, you know, this is based on, I think, the clinical 
observations and wisdom from over the years. Enough you know, psychiatrists and physicians have seen people, the casualties in the emergency departments. And I think there's a strong enough of an observational signal that I would argue that right now it would be unethical to subject that to the stringent empirical testing. I mean, you could take, you know, uh, you know, 40, you know, uh, you know, er people in their early 20s that have strong signs of being premorbidly schizophrenic but aren't, haven't had a first break yet, and then give half of them psilocybin and half of them, you know, not. I mean, that would be horribly unethical. That's what you would need to do. But I, I, I just think it's convincing enough that we have to play it safe. I mean, and nearly all of the examples in the early era where, well, in currently where pe the, the claims that, oh, someone went on a trip and they never came back, it's pretty striking that those, those seem to be cases where someone did have some sort of signal. I mean, it seemed to be the case with um, Sid Barrett, the first singer of Pink Floyd, that you know, and, and often these things go along with each other. When is, when is the first psychotic break? Adolescence or, you know, or the, in the early 20s. When did people first start dabbling with drugs? <laughs> Same time period. So it's, it's difficult, but I think it's really important given that level of harm that we play it cautious. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, first of all, I want to thank you for all the work you do. I think it's really awesome. Thank you. I was actually a participant in the meditation study in 2012 through 2013. Oh, wow. Which is really cool. Um, I, this is the first time I've actually seen some of the data from that, so really neat. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to see that the National Institute of Drug Abuse has started funding this study. Um, what kind of hesitancy or resistance have you received from uh, government and federal agencies? Yeah, so you know, you've raised a really interesting point because, in fact, that support has not come from a, a so called extramural grant where we've applied for it and they said, yes, we'll fund therapeutic psilocybin work. They've actually not funded therapeutic psilocybin work. But so this gets into the organizational chart of the USNIH, but in fact, each of the institutes has most of their research they fund is extramurally. They give grants to universities here, there. But a subset of their research happens within intramural programs. So this is actually on that same Hopkins Bayview campus. It's the biggest building on campus. So there's a really great re neuroimaging research there named Elliot Stein, who's one of the earliest um, resting state proponents, um, very w widely regarded. And they have the discretion to kind of you know, collaborate with researchers they want to collaborate with. So his take was basically, you guys are either making this stuff or up or I think you're onto something. <laughs> and so he kind of trusted us, so he said, I don't think you're making it up. So, so he's actually not administering psilocybin. It's technically a separate study where he is imaging people before and after and then long term. So he's not administering it. But so it's kind of a... Uh, there is, there, there is and, and you know, and that's understandable, but I think it's shifting. I think after 20 years of data with the record of safety and efficacy, potential efficacy, and I, I'm hopeful that's going to change within the next few years. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. That sounds like a great idea. I mean, I think that's, that's beyond where we're at now. And some of these, there's going to be a limitation. In, so yeah, in humans, you can give protein synthesis inhibitors, right? So you could presumably, yeah, block 
postdoc some of the or you know, yeah some of the presumed changes that might mediate that. So I mean, basically, I'm saying I think that's a good idea. You know, we need to um, really do what we can. Sometimes there are limits. Obviously, you can do more in, in non-humans, but then we still don't really know whether you're going to get the therapeutic-like effects and, and to the degree that it's kind of mediated more at the cognitive level, um, you know, issues like personal narrative. I mean, I, I tend to think, and I'm primarily a, a behavioral psychologist, not a you know, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. You know, I'm not a, you know, primarily, you know, a, a brain imager or, uh, you know, an expert at the biological level. But I, I, it makes a whole lot of sense to me that what we are dealing with is something that increases flexibility temporarily, not just necessarily during the session, but in some period afterwards. Sometimes it's called an afterglow, and it might very much depend on how, what behaviorally is done to, to cement that change in behavior. Um, so yeah, presumably this is going to, there's a decent chance this is related to, um, um, yeah, protein expression and, um, and different forms of, of, you know, perhaps neurogenesis, um, changes in, in network activity. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, I'm wondering whether to, in order to be a subject in a test like this, any of the tests we've been talking about actually, has it, is it important that, that the people involved have not any prior experiences with psychedelics? That the, is like kind of their first experience of psilocybin. Right. So um, that's a great question. In our the very first study Roland did, 36 people, no one had, that was a requirement, no one had previous experience. I think in our second study, in health, again, in healthy normals, that was true for almost everyone. A, a couple of people had, um, many decades ago, like a trivial experience. In, in other studies, so for example, our smoking cessation study, I, it, it's less restrictive, so we do avoid people that have like regular use. So if someone says, "Oh, I use a few times a year," we don't use them just because, you know, it's a guess. But there could be the idea that if you're using this on a more regular basis, even a few times a year, it may be that the experience is less salient for you. It might have have less ability to kind of cause a disruption in your functioning. This sort of plasticity, so. We've avoided people like that, but we've had a number of people that have, have had used A typical thing is someone says, yeah, I used a few times back in college, like 25 years ago. And most people, for most people, it's, it's sort of like a, more of a typical report. They say, oh, they were at a party, and they remember giggling a lot, and, you know. That's, um, so there's a mix. There's a good a mix of both, both types of, of people. And, and we haven't found any evidence so far that it really makes a difference, you know, uh, whether you're, you've never done it before, whether you have, you know, some distant past use. Hi, um, what, uh, think about the planning a group where you uh, choose some of the like, uh, the for the, the mental and like, um, uh, what's it called, um, violin training for, for the withdrawal. And using what for the withdrawal? Oh, okay. Yeah, you know, I, I think it, it's testable. I mean, that's kind of my answer to a lot of the questions about, you know, what about trying this or that. I mean, the great thing is that I think compared to the older era of research, where I think there was a little more um, dogmaticness dictated by psychoanalytic theory. I think you know now I, I want to be on more on the empirical side. If it's plausible, it's testable, and, and I, I I don't want to be a purist. I mean, I think you could say, oh well, no, if they're truly you know kind of there was this older idea that, well, if you have this this kind of powerful influence, it's almost like you're enlightened, and now we wouldn't need any of these other tools in life. And I just think that it sounds naive. I mean, when you're dealing with something like treating addiction or long-standing depression, like you, you've got to, it's fine to use, you've got to throw the kitchen sink out of it, at it, you know, like, you've got to use the tools, like, 
I could easily imagine that the best results could come from using psilocybin short term and then using some other medication following it to just hit it from all angles. Um, and they shouldn't really be viewed in competition with one another. I think the older era would have looked at that kind of more as a crutch. And I think that's kind of a limited way of thinking about it. But that's, that's a good idea. Hi. Uh, one of the first experiments they made, I think, in San Quentin many years ago, they had an extreme cure rate of the hardest criminals, 80-90%. And then 34 years later, Psychology Today wrote about it almost no one dared to look into it. But a lot of these criminals and psychopaths and sociopaths have very rigid perceptual patterns and they're multiply addicted usually. And probably you can find changes in their brains. Mm -hmm. so some people, I believe, might react stronger because they have much more work to do. And some people, they gave LSD to a yogi, 1,000 milligrams, and he didn't notice very much, he said. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. in Gothenburg in the early 60s, they gave it to children with schizophrenia. Right. And the girl said at first, why am I crazy all the time? That was her first comment. Because during the LSD, she was not schizophrenic. And then it returned eight hours later. So, uh, and uh, regarding the kitchen sink, there's the possibility of using very low dose psychedelics or derivatives to use as cognitive enhancers. Yeah. Because then you get this slight improvement of perceptual and mindfulness and such things. So that's another thing which is overlooked that you can have. Most people don't think very well. You just improve that, they get out of a lot of automatic behavior. Yeah. So. Yeah, I agree. The, the, I mean, we're going to be looking. Fortunately, part of that new funding will allow us to look at the idea of microdosing, which is using these smaller doses. It's sort of a little more, it's, it's one of the exciting and interesting things about psychedelic therapy, traditional psychedelic therapy, is it's about having one or a few very strong experiences that tend to change behavior dramatically. And it's, get, it's, it's different from the typical medical model of psychiatric treatment and you know, using um, medications, drugs that change behavior or thinking on an ongoing fashion. So the microdosing idea is, is more like treating a psychedelic like a traditional psychiatric medication, using it on an ongoing fashion. But like I said before, I, mean, I think empirically, like it's, we're going to be testing some of the claimed benefits of microdosing. So far, the two laboratory studies that have looked at it um, have not provided any support for the claimed benefits. In fact, it looked like only a little bit of impairment and ratings that the people were a little bit high. But there's a lot of there's a lot they didn't do. So I think there's much more. There very well could be validity to some of the claims that people are making. And so we might have to do a better job at you know how we look at that in the lab to validate it. But I think it's I think it's promising. You know I think, and it could be that there's a, a a, a medical or useful therapeutic pathway for both of these those approaches, yeah. And the other research you refer to, the yeah, the the, and I think they were referred to as autistic schizophrenic children. The whole diagnostic categories were different back in those days, and um, yeah, some of that stuff is so interesting. I think for a lot of reasons, it's not the first thing we're looking at, and I'm you know I'm open minded. You know maybe you know, probably would want to test that with adults. Um, I mean, just it, that, you know, there's so many complications there. It could be, there are some anecdotes of people with schizophrenia saying that they've been improved by psychedelics. But it, as I said earlier, it does look like there is ex these examples of people with psychotic disorders that are harmed. So I don't want to say that psychotic people should, you know, that will never find um, that they could be useful in a certain way. We, d we should be very, very cautious. But yeah, there's a whole, I mean, such an interesting historical background. Uh, how about, you were an expert, I've heard, in these security measures, uh, how to take care of all the circumstances, yeah. create the set and so on. And you had, of course, people uh, 
making such lists once before, like uh, John Lilly and Tim yeah. Lilly and those right. guys. So all the factors, how do you look upon those early forms of precautions and set rules? Some of them, I mean, I think what we, we tried to do di was distill the, the common lessons. I mean, it was largely that paper, I mean, it heavily referenced. I mean, there were hundreds of citations to that older research. So we did, in fact, um, synthesize, you know, based on that older era. Some of it was from, so for example, you know, Leary, I mean, one of his interesting pieces of work was this, uh, the, the, the guidebook based on the Tibetan Book of the Dead. So it's, you know, coming from a more religious particular religious perspective that probably, while it might be useful, is probably not the way forward in mainstreaming a medical use. And if it works, there's probably analogous methods that you could use that aren't, you know, as idiosyncratic. Um, but I, in fact, think, think Leary articulated a lot. I mean, he gets a lot of bad credit and doesn't get enough good credit. I mean, he, you know, uh, there's validity to both. I mean, he what did really explain, uh, he had, had a remarkable ability to explain the importance of, of set and setting. He wasn't the first to articulate the concept, but I think he probably did the best job up until that point and really, uh, r really being very vocal about the, and describing the importance of set and setting. So, yeah. I have a question about the set and setting study on religious yeah. Uh, those of you who don't know, uh, I think a few years ago, John Hopkins started planning a study of psilocybin that would entail the returning psilocybin in the control section for several religious leaders. Yeah, so that's a small study we, um, we're aiming for. We ended up with 13 participants. And so this is a, it's a very small study. And it's it sort of, you know, it's not like we're treating a disorder. It's not people coming with a certain problem. So it's sort of casting the nets wide with the idea of like, okay, many people report extraordinary experiences, often from a spiritual, or well, not always, but spiritual and or religious framework. So what would these people, sort of like in the spirit of the work we've done with meditation, what would people with a re relig what would religious leaders say about the nature of this experience? And one of the things, and I don't have, unfortunately, results to tell you we're, we're we just I think we're still waiting for the long-term follow-up of a single final participant. But so we don't know the answers yet. But um, one of the things that I'm most interested in is even though they didn't come in complaining about these problems, I, I, I'm interested in if we're seeing any reversal in, in burnout. You know, people that maybe um, they've been doing this a long time and maybe they've kind of become a little disillusioned and maybe they um, lost the connection, the, the empathy. I mean, it's hard, like when one of your, the people in your congregation or synagogue what, is, is ill and you know, someone's had a heart attack and you're going to the hospital at three in the morning to be with a, a lady whose husband is, is suffering, that type of thing, you know, and uh, everyone bringing their problems on you you know, and like you don't have any problems of your own. Um, so I'm kind of wondering whether these types of things um, maybe could be helped, like people could, you know, whether could people would report like a, a, a re-energization, re -ener whatever that's called, more energy <laughs> about being able to kind of help, help people um, and kind of like thinking, oh yeah, that's why I went into the ministry or to the, whatever the tradition is, you know, you know, 30 years ago. I don't know. And, and then just acutely, like, what's the nature of these experiences? Like, in a Christian, do you see more Jesus experiences? In a, you know, a Buddhist, do you see more Buddha experiences? Um, and are there commonalities? Uh, you know, do, do, do those dimensions of mystical experience hold up? Unfortunately, we don't have this statistical power to say, you know, we'll only have a few of each type, so it's not like we can, you know, come out saying, oh, it's really convincing that the nature of the mystical experience is psychometrically similar across the different religions, but we'll, we'll at least have very small trends to potentially speak to that, that question. Yeah, I'm, Hi. Uh, I'm really 
curious, uh, given your extensive uh, experience and knowledge when it comes to psilocybin research, if you think there is something that has not been looked at at all as of yet that would be very interesting to look at in the future. Yeah, I think that's just a lot. I mean, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, so, so, um, so like in addictions, the exciting thing I've talked about, it's like unlike most of it, you know, addictions medicine where it's typically, there are some exceptions where it's about, you know, a drug that quells the response at that, at the receptor mediated effects for that drug system. So like nicotine patch for smoking or methadone or buprenorphine for opioid addiction. So gosh, if, if this is true that there's a cross addiction efficacy, we just need to trust every drug addiction we can find. We need to test methamphetamine. We need to test um, opioids. I mean, you name it, like whatever people are uh, having an, an issue with, cannabis um, dependence. Uh, anything that someone wants to quit and they're struggling with, like I, I think we need to test all of those, all those boundaries. And then outside of, um, I, you know, outside of addictions, anything where I think there, you can argue there's a, a distorted self-narrative. So that's one of the reasons we're looking at anorexia. I mean, this idea that everyone around them, you know, and the person says, oh, I'm so, I'm so fat, and this person is starving to death. And the distortion is so high that maybe given a profound change, you know, this mental flexibility, maybe there can be a realization. I talked to a, um, to an individual who said she had overcome addiction, or I'm sorry, anorexia, because of an experience with a psychedelic. I, so uh, there's uh, anecdotes for a lot of these things. Um, any disorder associated with depressed mood, so we're gonna be testing that with some of the mood within Alzheimer's disease and post-treatment Lyme disease, and alcoholism combined with depression, so three studies will kind of further test the boundaries of depressed mood. Um, oh gosh, something that's really interesting that's a little further out there is basically anything you consider a, a psychosomatic disorder. You know, some of these really mysterious disorders, oh, um, conversion disorders, um, uh, autoimmune reactions. You know, so Andy Weil, kind of the self-help uh, doctor who's wellness, holistic uh, doctor in the United States who's written a lot of books, he reports in the early days that he did, had a couple of LSD sessions where, like for example, one time he was horribly, he was horribly allergic to cats, and then one time on a high dose of LSD, I think he was like laying on a hammock you know, or something and a cat jumps on him, and instead of like getting it away, he says, I'm just gonna like gel with the cat. And he said he never had a cat allergy from then on. I mean, you know, it's just an anecdote. So I don't, you know, I'm not going to say that's real, but I know enough about psychedelics to make, to suggest that there might be something there that have, and, and combined with what we know about some of these psychosomatic conditions where the, I mean, the connections between the, you know, the brain, the mind, and the body are profound. I think, I mean, I mean, which is another exciting thing about psychedelics. I think these are, regardless of treating issues, they, they're just powerful tools at, at, like, at, at discovering so much, including understanding the, 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 the brain-body connection. So that's one example. Can we treat like allergic and other you know, diseases that might have this sort of um, autoimmune or some sort of psychosomatic component? Yeah. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. That's that's really inspiring and, and hopeful. I want to um, end with a with a question, also relating to the future. So we're living in a really exciting time, and this field seems to be opening up more and more. And there's even even funding and, and money coming in, which yeah. is of course both both an opportunity and also challenging with with capitalism being yeah. capitalism. So. I was curious, what what do you see as the main sort of challenge for the for the future for for those of us in the field? I think uh, these experiences come; they're associated with such different traditions, and often from a spiritual perspective. I think it's 
a, a huge challenge is how to integrate these into mainstream medicine and avoid when, like the guru complex. It's difficult to be personally associated with a, an intervention that can sometimes profoundly affect someone's life and to not take advantage of it. Everything we know about the importance of boundaries and the importance of therapeutic relationships is brought under a magnifying glass. I think that there's this other aspect of the cultogenic effect it's been called, like this idea that like, you know, people want to form a thing, or like this, these experiences can be so profound, they want to like slap names on phenomena and they want to form groups and you know, you know, maybe start a religion, this type of thing. I think it's really important to not um, and use nothing, you know, I'm only talking about what medicine and modern mental health care does with this. I'm not critiquing anything that indigenous cultures do or with, you know, um, other, you know, you know, outside of that framework, what folks are doing. But I think it's important from a medical and mental health perspective that we um, re remain firmly footed in an empirically informed framework and um, yeah, be cautious about bringing in models that are just not informed by science. You know, models from this religious tradition or spiritual tradition or that tradition that might be pointing to some something with a with a truth to it, but it's it's nothing that we have data on, and it's nothing that we can really speak with authority about. You know, like chakras, just being an example. You know, I can't speak with any authority. I don't know what that is. I'm not saying people shouldn't do <laughs> with chakras what they do outside of you know, medicine, but, you know, I think the, the one can be, you know, um, tempted to kind of move into non-empirically informed areas, and I think it's, it's just going to be critical that we maintain a, and, and this doesn't mean being cold, and it doesn't mean not working with the framework that someone comes with. If a client comes believing in Jesus, they can talk about Jesus. If they believe in chakras and plant spirits, that's fine too. It's different than Im from imposing those beliefs on that, you know, just like any good therapist, if the person is a Christian, they come talk, they say, oh, they believe about their beliefs in Jesus, that's perfectly fine. But, you know, do not, you know, it's not your role to introduce any of those frameworks that aren't firmly rooted in mental health care and an empirical um, foundation. Thank you. A warm applause. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, for those of you who have uh, more questions, we'll be around for a little while. Our next lecture here at Karolinska is October 7th when Anne Wagner is coming to speak about MDMA assistant psychotherapy.